All right, everyone, welcome back to Design Huddle. Today, we're going to be talking about resume design as well as useful interview tips for UX designers looking to make a switch or even get their first job. Um, of late on Twitter, there was a pretty cool um, example from this uh, designer named Emily v Vu. I heard it last name's VU. Um, it's at EMVU tweets, but she posted this awesome Spotify themed resume, which helped her get her dream job at Spotify. So if you're watching us on YouTube, um, I'll share screens and you guys can see it for everybody listening. We'll describe it, but it's pretty straightforward. It's ultimately, um, it's just like that she made her, her CV or her resume look like, uh, the Spotify UI. But before we get into it, I have to see how my co-host Mustafa is doing. Mustafa. Yeah, man. I'm all right. You know, it's <laughs> looking at CVs, applying for jobs, <laughs> <laughs> learning about the, the best practice for CVs. Uh, no, I'm not too bad. How are you doing? Man? All good. All good. I think this is a good topic, though. I mean, uh, we do have we have like a broad range of people that follow Design Huddle. Um, a bulk of it is UX designers. This kind of started as a UX podcast that we're kind of branching out into new realms. But um, there's like some very actionable things that I always like, you know, think that people can do that are pretty straightforward. So I'm sharing my screen real quick, um, just so in case anybody that's subscribed to our YouTube channel can see what we're looking at. Um, but it's pretty sweet. I mean, it, it really jumps out. It shows how much how passionate you are about a particular company. The risk is you're putting a lot of time and effort um, in hopes that. Um, you land the job. Can you see? Can you see my screen, Mustafa? Yeah. No. So, I, I mean, to say that I mean, here's the thing, right? Uh, if you're going up for a job, the more effort you put into it, the more likely uh, the outcome is going to be greater. It, and everything obviously will come at a cost. But uh, as if this designer Emily, she really wanted to get this job, so she's designed her CV to look like the UI. Um, so it's like green and black and whatnot, and this will stand out from the rest of like uh the other cvs that that recruiters get and like it will make designers smile and pay much more special attention when they're reading to the actual detail and also like you know it's, as an entry point in an interview you say oh look we saw your cv that was really cool and just look these anything that can uplift and give people a positive boost of your stuff is going to look good right um Obviously, you can't really scale this. Like, if you're to do one for every single, like, for Facebook or for Google or for like, whatever, it becomes a bit more difficult, right. and it, it doesn't necessarily work as well. Uh, and then, if it gets out that you're doing your CV, designing it in the style of whatever company, then it looks kind of cheesy that you're just basically being a bit manipulative in a way, because like you don't really want to work; that you just want to get a job anywhere. Um, but which is fair enough in itself. But yeah, I mean, it's. It is a cost, but then the payout obviously is, is good, like when it does pay off, you know? Yeah, I think the other thing that's interesting is that you also need to meet the minimal qualifications. Like if you look at Emily's website, she has like a pretty stacked portfolio and she has previous like work experience. She's like a little bit more uh, junior, but I, I just think like this is an easy way to your point. Like the resume jumps out, she's going for a design role like it's, it's it's a super cool way to you know separate yourself from thousands of other applicants um the other thing that i really like about the uh, actual resume which we'll link to the tweet um in the show notes is uh, she does like the little things right it's like these little details that like really separate it it's like yeah you could have just done like you know the spotify gradient and like pick the spotify green or the spotify font but there's the heart buttons as the bullets, which is like when you favor a song, when you like favorite a song on Spotify, it's the exact same heart, which is such a little thing, but it's so cool. Um, that like really stood out to me. And then there was one other thing that I thought was cool. Um, oh, it was like the size of the call to action buttons. So she has like website, LinkedIn, email call and the button, like the, like the pill CTA buttons look exactly like the, the Spotify buttons, which I also thought was just like a nice touch. Yeah. No, it, it, again, it's like these things will, um, these things would be great. Like, you know, for designers to see like the attention to detail. And yeah. Again, it's an entry point, right? Like these things like this will get your foot into the door. 
and that's what you need and then from there on in the rest of your portfolio needs to really shine and so um nothing's really clever i remember interviewing brendan kearns who's been on the podcast as well uh and when he was working at envision he said someone sent in their portfolio as an envision prototype and so he said that was really really cool because it's like they're, they're showing that they can use the tool they're showing their passion for the tool and they're doing something a bit more clever rather than your generic uh you know free project portfolio website or like you know the, the typical screenshots of the mobile on a desktop version of an app or whatever that you're working on that after a while for people looking at cvs and whatnot they start to become blind to the actual visual so when you actually do something interesting it captivates the audience and as um communicators in design that's the you have to tell a story with your work you can't just go with like s screenshots on a website which by the way my own portfolio website which i haven't updated in about 10 years is exactly that it's thumbnails on a website um that worked once upon a time when you know when responsive web design was a novelty um, but today there's an expectation to be a bit more interested and above and beyond that so um showing passion in you in showing passion is one thing that will always work well in an interview or job prospect situation and i think whether you do a portfolio in envision or whether you do like a, um, a spotify styled thing i remember years ago as well do you remember pantone color charts yeah pantone colors yeah. for prints yeah one of my friends he actually designed his cv like one of those pantone colors so it's like each part of his career was one of the tabs because it was very expensive to produce so he'd only send it to companies he definitely wanted to work at but it always got him a callback, whether he got the job or not, like guaranteed, because designers really appreciate this kind of like novelty thing and they'll keep it on their desk indefinitely because it's like a cool corporate toy, right? Like, <laughs> because it's like, oh, look at the CV, you know, it becomes like a thing. Let me ask you this, you know, if you think... were in the interviewee, like if you were looking for to hire someone on your team and someone sent a resume that had like the Spotify or the Envision or the, you know, the other examples we've been talking about, would you, oh, would you like, overlook the fact they had maybe like a lower GPA in school or they had other red flags like they jumped around between jobs and they didn't have like one they weren't at a company for one year straight um, or even well, stuff I mean, like typos like would you like would you oh would you like uh, like forgive them for the creativity of it or does that stuff cancel each other out no I mean you judge things on their d individual merit so like you might mark them for like um you know interesting and sort of the uniqueness of their cv but like attention to detail is like if that's like a metric that you're looking at that's covered lots of things so like spelling mistakes you know they can happen but if it's throughout a cv or throughout a thing then you think we do have spell check like grammarly <laughs> i pay for right and i'm dyslexic so i and i always copy yeah. and paste text now and i always f find things which I, i've done wrong like even just um the spelling of a word looks familiar to similar to another word so the spell check hasn't caught it but the grammarly is like actually caught out and says oh no no i don't think you mean this word you mean this one although they're very similar i think again the more time you take spending on doing something the better it is and as a designer your job is to communicate um my cv's probably got loads my resume's got probably loads of mistakes in it um but yeah no, just like resume design in general you know uh the other thing you have to think about is how you have to design resumes at how recruiters think and work and also how designers think and work so and they're two different audiences so typically if you've got like a generic google doc or um, windows doc resume you always put like a very brief description at the top a highlight summary of your skill set like the tools that you use and whatever um and sort of like keywords because this is what recruiters will look for and then go straight into your current role again one thing which i i really st stands out is when people put impact numbers. I was the designer for, I don't know, Spotify, and we implemented blah, 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 and as a result, we saw an uplift of blah, blah, blah. Like, you're giving key things that, not just, I work here and I'm a visual designer and I do prototyping. Well, that's the assumption that you can do that anyway. Right? That's, that, to me, is like a bar, but what, what did you achieve? Um, for some agency type work, it may be the case where you just say, oh, we worked on X, and you list out some of the clients, so you know toyota or nescafe or whatever um and then again really bullet points so people can skim read it because remember most of you as we've spoken in a previous podcast there's research has shown most people are skim readers rather than methodical readers you might have a bit more detail for folks and the way you design it is that 
main thing, bullet points, and a bit more information, but people can actually scan for each section. Then at the end, you put your um, education and maybe personal interests, because some people really like to see that, okay, you volunteer for something, or you, like, you're into the pottery or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, and I, I think, you know, going back to your question, it all matters, right? It all matters. And so get someone to read it. I used to get folks to read my CV, like different people as much as possible um, for spell checking errors. In terms of like if people have jumped around a lot, I mean, there's so many reasons why that is, you know, you've got sickness or you've got like family life issues that have meant you, people have to move. Um, so I don't really worry about that too much. If someone's like 20 years in and they've only worked three months in every single company, that might be <laughs> an interesting thing. But then they may be a, they may be a contractor all those years, and they don't want to be full time, and now they want to go full right. time. There's, but then the first question I would ask them is, matters. yeah, exactly. So the the, the question first one is, are you ready to go full time? Because you've been like, are you able to, you know, because contracting is a very different mentality, you know, it's like smash and grab rather than a long term thing. Yeah. Um, what do you think? <laughs> I've never heard of that's funny. Um, yeah, just I, I think it's a gaming reference from StarCraft. That's why it's like smash and grab the resources rather than you know cultivate i think sales say that you know it's like are you a gatherer or a hunter which means <laughs> do you cultivate a relationship over a long period of time for a bigger win or do you just grab what you can the hunters <laughs> what you can and eat that day gosh yeah that's a i mean it's a accurate metaphor um no i i tend to agree I do, those are just like some common pitfalls but if i just summarize like everything we've kind of talked about it's like you know adding data you know numbers to basically justify the work that you've done so you can focus on the impact, I think is huge. Um, you know, doing something that helps you stand out, that's like design or formatting your resume in some particular way to make it, you know, attractive to everyone who's looking at it. Um, using the keywords that the job posting has is also something that, you know, we kind of like hinted at that always is like a good best practice. Um, and then as you mentioned, I think one of the easiest things to do is just like run it by a bunch of friends or people that like can give you like feedback. Because chances um, are, it's like little, little tweaks that ultimately make it way better. Because um, I, I think a lot of people actually get a first version that's pretty solid, but it's the little tweaks, adding more data points, cutting stuff down, making it not feel bloated with like a bunch of buzzwords is also really tricky to do. Um, but those are some, those are some general tips. Anything else? Because um, actually, I've got a question for yeah. you because you were like a, a judge on awards.com. So you must have seen a lot of portfolio websites. Uh, what were the ones that usually stuck out for you? Yeah, so for portfolio websites, it was always like the first thing we looked at was um, this is like a little bit. All, so like right off the bat, all of the ones were like they're incredibly visually appealing, right? So like the the bar is very high. So a lot of it yeah. was being a little like nitpicking, to be honest. So one of them would be like, <laughs> did this site load in a reasonable amount of time? How did it look on mobile? Um, um, the other thing that I really liked is not just the visuals, but a brief description of the process and the justification for like how they came up for, with the design. Because sometimes when you just put out like the end product, it's not as helpful um, as like the journey to get there. So like I'm like a little bit, I liked seeing um, like there was a storyline for like what was the problem they were trying to solve? Like what was the design process? And then it was like, what the, what was what did they actually end up shipping and then what were the results so it was this like really well bundled story with these like incredible visuals like i i won't every single one that i looked at from awards like the portfolios and the visuals were just like top notch like these are some of the best you know visual designers that i like i've ever seen so it's the small things it's the storytelling piece it's the you know, does it look good across different devices? Is it load fast? Like these are things that can kind of help differentiate you because a lot of designers have these beautiful portfolios and then they have like 10 megabyte images and it's like, a and then like, you know, it takes the page forever to load. To me, that's just like, you know, you might be a great visual designer, but maybe you don't understand like the relationship between your design and like the front end um, and how it'll actually perform once it's like a live design. Yeah, no, that's that's true. Um, I suppose the the thing is, so it's also not necessary to argue against that. Is when I've seen some UX portfolios, I get exhausted by the same sort of thing where you see there's a photograph of sticky notes, there's a photograph of like 
you know, the design sprint, uh, like double diamond, yeah, yeah. and like, and there's, and sometimes I think, are you just putting it here because you're trying to check a box, or did that's a fair, that's a fair, fair point. But then it's like, but then what? What are you supposed to do? Like, there are folks who want to see, like you. People don't have the context of your project, so the more you put there, the better. Um, I mean, I think it might be worth having a too long don't read at the top. Like, here's the outcome. The, as this is what we did, and here's what here was the result, and then you lead into the actual story. And so that if if someone wants to see, okay, right, they've designed something for I don't know, Facebook, and this is what they this is how they did it. But then if they want to really go into much more detail, it's like, okay, right, how did they get to the steps? Because it's almost like, you know, in films, you start at the end and then work your way back to see how the person, the character got to that position. Right. Um, but then I don't know, it's like everyone's got their own remix and tells them their story their own personal way, I suppose. Yeah, no, I think there's, I mean, that's a great kind of like summary. Um, cool, so let's just quickly transition over to just like interview tips. Um, again, this will vary a lot depending on the role. So two things just to kind of kick off the conversation that I always recommend is like being prepared, being prepared as much as possible, doing that pre-work and knowing like the company to the best of your ability, like really having a good idea of like what the company does, what's their mission, what's their audience, um, like what's their differentiating like value prop of what makes them different. Those things will all help you. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of just like being super prepared and then under preparedness, like this pre-interview process, um, there's companies like Glassdoor, which have like a list of like company uh, questions um, that are pretty accurate. And even if they're not, they're just like good to get your brain thinking about like what potential questions you could be asked. Um, and having a framework in your head when you go through these questions is also like super helpful. Um, so yeah, those are just two for like the pre like the pre interview process. Um, what about you? What what were your top tips for how to land your dream UX job? I think when it's like if you go to say Glassdoor and look at say the UX questions, try and because um, the format is usually you give a presentation. Like in most job these days, most job interview UX interviews or product design, you give a presentation and then you go through a series of questions depending on the side of the company. Like different interviews will focus on different aspects. But if you're able to answer some of those questions in the presentation, like how did you do that? You know, who did you collaborate with? Uh, how did you discover that information? How, what were the other design explorations? You know, like how do you partner with whatever? Um, then what it does is it forces the interviewer to really think about and question about the work itself rather than giving you these generic questions where they're trying to check stuff off. Um, and so like, and also that helps you in your presentations like to make sure that you're answering the right things, but not like spending so much time on, and this was step one of the user journey in a diagram. Like you want to be as brief, but to the point and just to, and then also giving them a bit of scope to be able to ask a bit more questions. Um, and so like the, the way I've done stuff in the past is, again, start at the end. So this is what the end result was. Then let me show you how we got there. Maybe show a slide of a couple of sketches, maybe like something to do with research. Um, the different things, the evolution of the design from like, you know, this was initial whatever, and then you carry on through that. And then in the actual interviews, it's, some companies have um, changed, like I've noticed, uh, so before you used to get design challenges, which I've always been skeptical of because how can you realistically design something that doesn't exist and you can't with real users while you're actually working full time? Like how is that really a reasonable thing for companies to ask people to do right. for free? Um, but some companies still do it. And so obviously um, I, I'd be curious because people also, what I've noticed is I thought saw these like illustrations that folks are using in their slide decks. Um, I thought, oh my God, everyone's a really great illustrator. And then I found out like where you had icon sets, you have illustration sets, which people can buy and they're using them. And when I found that, I was actually thought quite disheartened that you're using someone else's work without explicitly saying it. But I'm curious if, if someone was to you go on Fiverr and just hire a bunch of people for the UX task to demonstrate that, listen, I wanted to do this, but I work full time. So what I did was I did a plan. I hired a visual designer to do <laughs> if that would be cheeky or not. Because I know there was that guy who was on Reddit who said, um, he got a design job where he was just, uh, but he wasn't a designer, and but he knew how to use Photoshop and Illustrator. We've spoken about this before, and then he um, went on Fiverr and he'd hired people to just do the stuff for him, and he spent all day on Facebook and YouTube, <laughs> and then you'll get like rough mocks, and people say, "Oh, what do you think of this?" and then he would change stuff. But then, you know, uh, there was a bit of controversy about that. Um, 
So that, I mean, yeah, but then I think practice with other folks as well. Maybe phoning up companies and say, hey, look, you might not have jobs, but would it be interesting? Can I show you my portfolio? And then get into the habit of showing your work and talking about it. Yeah, I think there's always like, there's a ton of like design challenges you can do to kind of hone in your your skills as well. So I think that would be, you know, one, one recommendation. Find a mentor as well. Yeah, me- that, that's another really good tip. The other one would be, when you get when you get asked a question, it's okay to ask qualifying like follow up questions, and also to make assumptions. I think like of like this is how I'm interpreting the question. Um, I actually think that shows like being a good designer because you're really making sure that you're answering the right problem to the you're, you're you're answering the right questions. So that like you know basically anchoring on like what is actually the question being asked, and then making some assumptions, to saying like this is like. What I'm assuming, like I'm assuming that we're designing for X like for the U.S. market. Um, I'm assuming that we're talking about just native, not web. Like, there's like assumptions that you should make. You know, I think that also helps you know uh, separate yourself a little bit. Yeah, and no, I've been asked questions in interviews before where they're asking three questions at once, and it's it's hard to do that. And they've got a limit, then they have to move on. Otherwise, it looks bad on you if you just keep talking about the same thing for a considerable amount of time. Um, the other tip I would have is about rejection. <laughs> like, what I've, some of my friends have been applying for jobs recently, and they've not they've been knocked back, whatever. And I, I, my thing is always, it's not necessarily about how how good you are; it's about how great your, the other people going for the job are, as well. Like, if if you're going for, say, I don't know, um, think of a like a taxi service app, let's say Uber or whatever, and someone's work, and you're competing with someone who's worked at Lyft, and you've never worked in that space before they're going to have a clear advantage because they aren't, they've worked in that space. And so um, you may never know who, who you are competing for for the job. It's like, don't don't be disheartened by like the rejection. And if possible, get as much feedback as you can because then that will help you for your next thing. So if someone says um, what you work, the, your examples of your work were too specific, then you can say, well, okay, for my next interviews, I might show some ver- extra variations in my work or might briefly go over them saying, you know, so people can see that you've got variation. If they say um, you didn't have enough experience in blah, think of the things that you might be able to demonstrate that, you know, or, you know, sometimes I've, I've seen feedback like don't have enough management experience. You're like, well, then maybe in your current role, seek to get more management experience. So it's like, think of like the, the best companies is the ones who give the best feedback, like, you know, of things that you can pivot on. Um, so don't always get disheartened, you know, rejections are part of it. Sometimes it's a blessing in disguise that you may not have got along with the folks in that company anyway, so... Yeah, I totally, um, that's totally agree. Um, that's really good advice. Let me ask you this. So kind of talked about like the pre-work during the interview, um, a little bit about post interview, but another common recommendation is to, when the interviewer asks, do you have any questions for me? Um, and coming up with like a few thoughtful questions. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there any questions that come top of mind that kind of really stand out as like, wow, this person, like, it's a really thoughtful question. And that like, is like, we're ending on a very high note because like, I really appreciated that. Yeah, so I mean, I'd look, basically, I'll, I'll always research the company's design culture. And if there's anything that's ever been said, positive or negative, I'll ask them about it. Um, Cause then it shows that you actually have some knowledge on the company. Uh, other than that's like, how do you collaborate with researchers? How do you collaborate with engineers? Because I don't want to work in a place where I'm stuck in a box and I don't get to speak to anyone. Like I, I just, I just don't, I want to be able to be in an environment where I can have a symbiotic relationship with engineer PM research in particular. Like what's, is there money and uh, research time to do stuff like, or are we just expected to just pump designs out and hope for the best? Like the, and the, just understanding their process about how they create things. Again, it's just like the way to think about it is backwards what would be your perfect design environment? And then think of questions that will actually tease out whether that environment is somewhere you actually want to work. I know sometimes we can be desperate for work, but is it worth going to a company that you're going to be unhappy with? Is what I would say. Um, and then also ask the designers, like, where, like, how did you get to this company? What's it like for you? Um, maybe it's like, you know, how is it, how's your dealings with design? What would be their ideal um, design partner you know, if you speak, especially being interviewed by an engineer or by a manager, you know, because then it, it gets, gives you an idea of their expectations of you. 
Yeah, I think those are like kind of more or less what I was going to say. The only other one I would add is I like to know what success looks like. So like if somebody exactly. stepped in this role, what is the first like 30 days look like? How are people tracked? Like what are the actual performance metrics? Because um, that also just shows that you're someone that comes in and like wants to exceed expectations. You want to know what like not just meeting what's on like the requirements of the role, but you want to take that one step further. And I think this is like, we haven't really talked much about this, but for a lot of companies, they're willing to take someone with less experience if they're a good culture fit. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of a culture fit. And, you know, when I was at GE, we used to like, there was an interview question, like when we would be taking notes, when we'd be interviewing someone that was like, would you want to sit next to this person for the next two years? And it's just like a very like, like, you know, did you hit it off with them? Is it someone that you could see sharing workspace with? Like, could you collaborate with them? Like, are they like yeah. willing? Are they, are they receptive to feedback is like another really important thing. Or are they coming across yeah. like they know everything and like it's their way or the highway? Cause like you obviously know that that's going to be very difficult to like move a project forward if you can't have a healthy discussion and debate, or if you just like refuse to budge and you're in, like, you know, incredibly stubborn. These are all like little things that like, I think, can help contribute to your success in an interview is like how well do you come across like your personality which i think is like in my opinion the most underrated part of the interview process it's like skills is obviously yeah. the bulk of it but like you as a person is so important i actually remember there's a funny story that when i was applying for jobs almost over 10 years ago um and it was i didn't know what the way the recruiters worked was um they didn't tell you what the company was until the day of the interview because I think they were worried that you're going to try and tap them in yourself. So I'm going to the thing, searching on my phone, trying to get some information about it, and it had next to nothing. So then going to the building is for a really major newspaper in the UK, and I'm going up the uh, es uh, escalator, and then there's this massive waterfall in, in the foyer, and that's obviously overwhelming, and then the person goes to the interview. So at the end of the interview, he goes, why do you want to work here? And my mind was blank, and all I said was, I want to work in a building that has a waterfall. And they all started <laughs> laughing. <laughs> yeah, because that's... Like, this, <laughs> Yeah, that's like, an amazing cause answer. <laughs> yeah, because it's like what, like obviously I have no int, and I said like I didn't have much, but like from the, the didn't have much insight to what the company's done, um, but it sounds like this is an interesting environment to work in, and they told me afterwards that that answer was one of the reasons why they actually selected me as a, as a, as a candidate because they said you sounded like someone who could fit. It was like in that place was a lot of banter and bubbly and sort of like jokey environment, and they said that yeah, this guy is a perfect fit for that. So like. Yeah. Well, it's, I think um, it's, obviously... it's that you showed your personality, but you also ended really strong, right? When you, so like, let's talk about it very logistically. When you're in, when you're interviewing someone, you're taking notes constantly, right? And then usually after you're done that interview, it's really important that you like share that feedback broadly with other people, like as soon as possible. So it's fresh in your mind. So if you leave someone like, you know, laughing or like, you know, saying like, oh, that person was like, you know, like really great. Like I could Fine. totally see them working with it. That last like, you know, minute or two, I think actually has like a lot of value of like ending strong, I think is a really important piece. Cause like, there's a little part of me that's like, I'm okay with people stumbling through the first, you know, five to 10 minutes to get the nerves out. And then usually people really hit their stride in the middle or the end, but yeah. ending strong is just such an underrated thing that you can do as well. And one thing I also one thing really I want to work in a building with a giant waterfall just for, I want to be yeah. on the record for that. One thing I would say is like, like long time listeners of the podcast will know that I like telling jokes and always something humorous. One thing that is you have to be very careful as well is in my career, I've noticed that most people are quite appreciate the sort of like humorous banter thing, but there is a small percentage of people who are seriously irritated by it, right? And you always have to be careful as well as feedback I've had in the way past, which I was really grateful for is like, if you're too humorous, um, it can sometimes detract from the really important things that you're saying. And as a result, people think, oh, that's just the, the person who makes the jokes. And you maybe say in a moment where you say something really valuable, but you become the label as the joker that people don't actually take what you say seriously. Not that they don't think you're like what you're saying is important, but it's just because you make that persona for yourself. And in working environments, it's all about as whether we like it or not, it becomes a thing of personas. So don't try and like if, if like okay let me tell three jokes a minute or whatever now, if it's naturally just a part of your personality fine but always like also monitor it because you don't want to 
are this person are they funny but will they actually do the work will they be messing around the like do you know because some people get really irritated by that i've seen like comments on youtube on some of my videos like the one was like literally i really hate this if this guy just spent time doing the talk he wouldn't be rushing like i hate his jokes <laughs> i thought it was like it's a bit harsh but but it genuinely does irritate some there is a small percentage of people who do not appreciate it and you have to think that in a working environment you have to cater for lots of different personality types as well so be funny if it's in your thing but don't yeah. try be like, someone you're not yeah i also think that i've been saying it for years you should probably retire as a ux uh lead designer and just really dive into stand-up comedy it's long overdue give the people what they want mate <laughs> like, i've been on stage and like if I, i've the, the problem is is my sense of humor like my real sense of humor is really dark. <laughs> but that lands. You just gotta have the right audience. But like, people love that kind of humor, especially in the world. We yeah, no. I, uh, I, I in, in previous working environments, I used to lay it out, and then the director just once went, "What the? Because <laughs> how can you even say that?" And I'm like, "What do you mean? It's just a joke, man." But yeah, I, I think. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. All right. Well, this was this was an awesome yeah. <laughs> awesome episode. Um, let me just do a quick summary, and then Mustafa, you fill in the gaps of like where we messed. We talked about resume tips, um, like top level, add data, make sure you like are getting peer reviewed, and really do something to stand out. And then on the interview tips, uh, some of the top things we touched on were being prepared, you know, knowing about as much as you can about the company or the interviewer, you know, really making sure that um, you. You, you're able to talk to your portfolio and making sure that you can talk about the process you would go through, answer the actual questions that are being asked, ask qualifying questions, make sure you're making assumptions, take your time to answer questions. Um, and then you can also, uh, one tip we didn't talk about, but I think it's really important is like thinking aloud. And lastly is like, be the X factor, be, let your personality shine through in the white, in the right ways, be very cautious with using humor. You know, but um, being confident and being personable will really help you stand out um, to make sure that you're the right candidate for the job um, and, you know, leave that interviewer um, feeling really confident that they're making the right choice. Anything else I missed? Yeah, no, just be mindful of your language as well. Like, don't, like, try not to swear. Like, just, even, even if it might be funny in a moment, if someone gets mildly irritated by you, that they focus on that. And so it's like, just be... Uh, you know, as uh, don't, don't just be mindful of that. And the other thing is, you know, rejection, it's, it's a fact of life. Um, maybe you're not ready for that role. Maybe you're competing with a candidate who is perfect for that role. And so these things actually happen. Um, and if you can get feedback, whether positive or negative outcomes, try and get as much like, especially the criticism, because even if you get the job, you want to make sure that you build on that, right? You know, you want to make sure that you're always improving yourself. Um, and also just like, you know, it's just a job, man. Love it's it. It's just a job. All right, brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode of Design Huddle. If you haven't done so, go over to your favorite podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit that subscribe button. Um, we recently launched a YouTube channel. We are slowly chugging along and getting new subscribers. We would greatly appreciate two things. One, subscribe. And please just share the video or a clip that you like with at least one friend. That would be massively beneficial Mustafa and I do this as a passion project for a long time. We really just want to get some of this advice out there and hear from you. Um, comments are always welcome as always. But thanks so much for tuning in this week, and we will catch you on the next episode. Peace. Peace. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Design Huddle. The opinions expressed are solely our own and do not express the views or opinions of our employer.